Okay, so uh, actually I, I think I, well I see from that banner that CCP4 seems to have ended in 2019. I, I assume that's not quite correct. Um, it's a very impressive number of people here. Um, I actually did a, a CCP4 study weekend session, I think I chaired a session in 2000. And so I'm going to review some of the material from then because it's quite nice to put it in perspective. So I'm, I'm going to do just, I wasn't clear what I needed to say. So I put together stuff that seemed to be relevant. Um, I like it if people interrupt with questions. So please do. And somebody needs just to tell me to end when I run out of time. Because <laughs> it's kind of a bit arbitrary. Okay, so um, for people who are new to the concept of the difference between maybe crystallography and yeah, but I thought I'd start, better start with some very basic stuff. So the thing that's, the thing that's different in when you do imaging is that you have a choice between recording the diffraction pattern and recording the image. And if you record the image, um, so in a microscope, you have an object, you have a, um, a sort of illumination, a condenser system, an objective lens. So the objective lens is the really useful thing here that gives you a choice. You can either put your detection in the diffraction plane and record the diffraction pattern, which would make it very equivalent to crystallography, and electron crystallography is, does that. Or in imaging, you have a choice of not recording there, but waiting until the image recombines the, so you, the waves are scattered by the object, they turn into the diffraction pattern before you transform in this plane. But if you don't record there, you can use the objective lens to recombine the waves into the full, into the image, back transform it. And so the image data contains the amplitudes and the phases. Unlike the diffraction data where you only record the amplitudes or intensities, in the image you record everything. And then you can, in, you can take the, uh, in the computer you can take the image and take the Fourier transform that and actually look at the amplitudes and the phases separately or together however you want to. So that gives you a little more flexibility in a way. It um, makes things a little bit different, but it's the basic theory is all pretty similar. So uh, that's the kind of very basic background. Um, what you can do with EM, I guess, is getting very familiar to a lot of people, but I thought I should just briefly review. There's quite a scale of, quite a scope of things you can do. Um, then it, it really connects very well to biology because there's, there are methods now for correlating fluorescence, which is obviously if you can fluorescently tag your gene of interest and find it by fluorescence microscopy, you can do dynamics and all kinds of other interesting things and then kind of track that same information through to, um, well, there's soft x-ray tomography, which is a little funny little niche area where you can get 3D tomograms. Or you can do electron tomography where you might be able to correlate directly. The, in both of those, you can correlate directly the fluorescence signal to the tom tomography signal, either an x-ray at lower resolution or EM at higher resolution. Um, and obviously then you can make pretty pictures with segmentation and so on. I think I've stolen this one from John Briggs. And if you, and this one from Julia Zanetti. So if you then go into more detail, you can do, now there's a, there's almost a continuum now really between electron tomography and single particle imaging at high resolution. Because in electron tomography, you get a 3D reconstruction from some kind of tilt series and you can then fish things out of that so you record different features in your tomogram and you can actually extract features little volumes and then by some very nice methodology now you can fish out 3d objects from your tomogram and actually align and classify those and average those and get to quite decent resolutions um, if you have a lot of your object if you record it in a way that most of the radiation damage happens at the higher tilt. So you record your best images at low tilt, and as you go to higher tilts, you, um, you, 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 the order of recording matters, so the first images are the best ones, and then as you accumulate radiation damage, you go to the higher and higher tilts on both sides. And when you want to average, if you have your object in the tomogram at different orientations, you can throw away the radiation, more of the radiation damage high tilt images in the end, and just combine all the low tilt data from things at different orientation and then get to quite good uh, resolution reconstructions. So there's a lot you can do now with tomography and subtomogram averaging. Um, and then uh, obviously single particle analysis is becoming very powerful. It's following very much in the footsteps of macromolecular crystallography and getting to quite decent resolutions and it, it overlaps a lot now with uh, crystallographic structures. So I want to take, take you back to 
the early days of blobology, the start of all this. And so obviously it's very, you can't do model fitting when your model is made of balsa wood. That's kind of tricky. And you don't have enough resolution to really understand molecular structure. But this was a really important start because obviously the whole idea of how you can get to 3D structures from um, projection images was very new. And in fact, Aaron Klug did worked out reconstruction, back projection from tomography or Fourier reconstruction from tomograms before, I think he actually did it before CT, before medical imaging, before Cormac and Hounsfield and whoever else did that, who I've forgotten, um, in South Africa, I think, um, before they actually worked out CT scanning. So it's the same principles, back projection from, you know, reconstruction from back projection, by back projection, but, or Fourier reconstruction, but um, it was actually started in EM as far as I know. So in the beginning, so the Cambridge group who were doing this felt that it was best to really stick to ordered samples and in particular if you had 2D crystals you could do a combination of electron crystallography and um, 2D, um, 3D reconstruction from tilde series. So this um, first uh, the first project where you could, that really got to protein secondary structure was um, bacteriodopsin, which is a 2D crystal. It's a single layer of a crystal. The images showed kind of nothing. And this was very spectacular because they showed cryo images or well, low, low dose images, which were featureless. But when they calculated the Fourier transform of the image, you could actually see the little spots. If they're circled there, you might not see, but there's a tiny diffraction spot inside each of those circles. And if you then filtered out all the noise all around the circles, only took the little dots and not all the other background, you could then actually see the projection of the trimers of bacteriodopsin with alpha helices in projection. So that was absolutely amazing because you could see alpha helices from nothing, basically. So that was like magic. And you could, if you took different tilts, then you could get some 3D information and they could make a nice uh, styrofoam balsa wood model of the helices in bacteria. So this was the first the first time people could see that membrane proteins had transmembrane helices and they went up and down through the membrane. I mean, the connections obviously weren't, because you, you can't tilt to 90 degrees, you, you were missing the, the loops and the other bits, but still it was a pretty good start. And so the idea is that you have, there's a three dimensional diffraction pattern, which is streaks because it's not, it's only a crystal in one plane. It's not a repeating, it's not repeating in three dimensions. So in the third, in the Z direction, it's actually just, lines of variable density and you have each tilt image, each projection recorded a different slice through those things. So you had to put together all that 3D information to get to 3D and this was a diagram that was done later for tubulin, 2D crystals of tubulin. So that's, that, was a, that showed that you could do this. And um, one thing that Richard Henderson did quite fairly early on, well, I don't know, quite, not quite at the beginning, was they realized that the lattice wasn't really that good, that the crystal, the crystal lattice wasn't that good, and especially for other than bacteria. Bacteriodopsin is this amazing material that you can actually dehydrate and it doesn't, it's like concrete, it doesn't actually die when you put it in a vacuum. So there were a lot of other things that had to be done um, to deal with most biological material, which you can't just stick in a vacuum, you have to keep it hydrated. So, but bacteriodopsin was good that way, but it wasn't a perfect lattice. And one thing that became very useful was to do what uh, Richard called unbending, which was to actually find by cross correlation, which is the main measure we use for all of this stuff, uh, was to find where the unit cells really are instead of where they are perfect in theory. So the real positions are some, you know, this is an exaggerated distortion. And then you could move it all back together. You could reinterpolate and get further by actually correcting this lattice disorder. So that kind of is the first step towards single particle analysis, which um, that early, the early sort of idea was that it had to all be ordered stuff and single particles were kind of not very good. But Joachim Frank, despite that disdain from the crystallographic people, um, started really pushing single particle analysis. He wanted to understand the ribosome. And the idea of crystallizing a ribosome was completely not considered at the start of this in the 1970s. And so the idea was that you had these projections, they're not uniquely gonna tell you the 3D structure, you know, a projection isn't, doesn't, it can guarantee what the 3D thing is. But, and then the first part, the first stuff was done by negative stain, looked pretty horrible, but that it was a kind of ribosome, you know, it was a 3D map of a ribosome, that was pretty good going to get that. Um, Marin Van Heel, so when, when cryo came out, Marin Van Heel and, and Joachim both worked on 
getting 3D reconstructions. And this is the kind of layout from, this is a picture from Elena Orlova and Marin. Um, so the raw images look absolutely unintelligible. Uh, you can hardly understand anything from those raw images. But once you have class averages, well, that starts to show you the large and small subunit and so on. And then the 3D little views, and then you have the reprojections. And if the reprojections match the input stuff, then it may be correct. Um, but if they're different, obviously it's wrong. So there's this ambiguity because you don't, projections and aren't, don't tell you everything. So the thing that was really, another essential step was the uh, finding that you could, you know, if you plunge things into liquid ethane, you could cool them without crystallizing the ice. If you had a thin enough specimen and near the top of a cellular specimen, you could see the cells look nice. And then uh, as you get further away, slower cooling, you get ice crystallization, everything's messed up. So if you could get vitrified specimens, that was a big step. So then you could start really getting, it was blobology, but it was accurate blobology. So it was accurate enough to say for Michael Rossman and Tim Baker and various other people to, to say, this is the right stuff. We can fit molecular, we can fit domains or molecules into this because this density is correct. It's just at very low resolution. So you could start to understand how things were arranged in viruses and their spikes and antibodies on them and so on. And this is where I, yeah, that's, that was the study weekend that, um, where I got involved in this and Michael and other people said lots of nice things. And there were some, you know, you could see there was progress uh, on the ribosome and on various virus things and people like Steve Fuller we're doing quite a lot with fitting. And Alan Roseman worked out this local correlation to, um, to fit the domains of Groyel. So the idea is that we had these domains that were rigid and there were hinges and you could, fit in, you could fit in the rigid parts and that was quite clear. So again, the early negative stain maps, you wouldn't really, you, was, you, know, you couldn't really fit things into that. But once you had cryo, even if it was low resolution, you could do this. And as the resolution improved, we could do more interesting things. I guess one of the, one of the really powerful things about single particle analysis, which has made it come very much into prominence, is that you can classify out different structures. And if you have flexible, if you have machinery that's working, you can find all the different structures from your single data set. And here's where we started working with uh, Maya Topf. And Agnel's going to talk about this flexium work where you can have flexible fitting, where you have rigid parts and they're connected by flexible parts. And as you get to higher and higher resolution, you can make the rigid bodies smaller and smaller. And so this is where we were able to get a series of, there's one mouse, go on. Uh, oh, Can I see the mouse on there? I'm supposed to be able to play a movie here. Yeah. Uh, I can't find the pointer. Oops, let's try this again. Oh, there we are. So if you play these, you can morph these, um, structures one after the other and you can see I mean the molecular dynamics simulation did not predict the trajectory of how these movements were going to happen in in this um, chaperone this Groyel where there are hydrophobic sites that are shown in red orange that are going to move around and be dragged off the pull away pull away from the specimen and so on so you you could do all these things by classifying out a series of different structures that were present simultaneously in the same sample and the same sort of idea with um, non-native proteins that were captured in the folding, as they were folding inside this big complex, you could capture by classification, because it's a, you start by denaturing your substrate and then mixing it rapidly with the chaperonin. So you, you, couldn't, you couldn't make a decent sample that way. You had to classify out lots and lots of different kinds of junk or things that did not contain what you wanted. And so the classification methods are very powerful and could do a lot of things that weren't really possible by any kind of averaging method. So the big change, the bit, the, so, so we all thought this was fine even before this resolution revolution. I mean, the rest of the world didn't, but you know, we were having a good time. Um, but then when they detect, so the, the problem was until really about 10 years ago, we were in the stone age, we were using photographic film to record our images because electronic detectors were rubbish for electrons. You had to convert them into light first and then convert the light and you know, then record the light as your digital signal. And so it's much more convenient to use CCDs, but they were really lousy and they, they, they scattered all over the place. There's these, this thick layer of conversion and you, you lost everything spread out and you lost a lot of resolution. And they're also very slow. So this movie from Ben Bamis, DE, shows that this is that the signal that gets stored, accumulated, and then it's read out line by line on the CCD detector. And that actually takes long. So that, that makes a long recording time. It's, it's 
turned out to be quite a disadvantage. We didn't realize how, what a disadvantage that was until the direct electron detectors uh, became available around 2013. And they've got much, th they're back thin, so you have a much thinner, uh, you have less chance for the, the signal to spread out, so it's, you don't lose spatial resolution nearly as much. But the other really unexpected huge advantage, whoops, was that, let's try and play this one, um, that the readout, because there's much more electronics, each line of pixels has a readout, so it's much, much faster, very much faster, especially Gatan made, has made extremely fast detectors. And the advantage of that was really quite surprising, that aside from the, this fantastic improvement in resolution and in digital quantum efficiency, was that if you could take images that fast, and they each had such good signal, you could actually correct for beam-induced motion. So when the electrons hit the ice, things move. You can't help that. And that meant that, you know, Nigel Unwin had to throw away this much, this pile, high of a pile of photographic films where things moved and keep only the tiny few where it happened not to move. But now what you can do is record a movie instead of an image and then readjust the frames of the movies. There's enough signal in each in a set of subframes that you can find the signal and say, okay, it moved from here to here, I'll just move it back. And so you start with an image like that and where you only see data in one direction because it's moved in the other direction. So you've lost all that. In the old days, that was lost forever. But now you can just re do movie correction, motion correction, and the same data, you re realize it's the exact same data and you have all the data back. So that, is, that made a huge difference. So you recover all this lost data. And that, that was really spectacular. So this was one of the earlier first examples of comparing the X-ray and the EM for the proteasome. Um, so you can see the maps are quite similar. This is, it's not the same scattering mechanism. So it's, this is the Coulomb potential. This is the electron density for X-ray. Um, the, the one biggest, the biggest difference is the uh, negative uh, side chains, the glutamate here sticking out. Um, so that's charges are scattered differently. Um, but otherwise, it's very, very similar. And there's no reason to think that the vitrification changes anything much either. So it's pretty much the same. It looks like the same stuff. The scattering factors are not exactly the same. And I think Garib is going to talk more about that. But um, that's, it, it looks like the right stuff. And now, you know, lots of people get excited about getting very high resolution. And here's some example from Sri Ram Subramaniam, who's very keen on showing that you can get very high resolution. So. Um, it, it really can go very well. If you have enough of the same confirmation and you really do everything right and your microscope's very good, the ice is the right thickness, there's lots of things that have to be right, but it, it is actually much more feasible now to get to these higher resolutions. So um, the other, but one, a couple of things to keep in mind, uh, particularly when you're fitting models, the resolution is not the same all over a structure. It's never the same all over a structure. So in single particles, there are flexible, these are not in a lattice, they're not constrained, so the surface things are often more flexible or they're hinges. And so there's, all, there's almost always parts of the structure that are lower resolution. So clearly you cannot do the same kind of fitting all over the structure. You can, the highest resolution parts will be clear, you can, you know where to put everything, and then the lower resolution parts you won't be able to. And you'll have to guess or use other methods. So you have to use a combination of approaches to fit something where you have lower and higher resolution parts. And that's almost always the case. The other thing is if you're using any kind of tomographic data, obviously there's a very extreme difference. There's an anisotropy because when you do the tilt series, said you, don't, you can't tilt beyond 60 or 70 degrees. So there's a lot of, miss, there's all missing data in the beam direction. And things like spherical vesicles, that purple thing there, it's actually gonna miss its top and bottom density because that's just missing information. So you have extremely anisotropic resolution. So again, it would be hard to fit to something like that. So you have to know, you have to know what's reliable on the maps in order to fit them properly. So I think I'm, yeah, I'm just close to the end here. I'm just gonna, I was just gonna summarize the single particle stuff. Um, I, I really covered all these things saying, you know, you can just have these things in solution. You can, if you do it all right, you can get quite good resolution. Um, one thing to stress, and I think it's in my abstract, but I haven't said it just now, is that when refinement is a very different business. So you refine the map by refining the particle. Or, so every single particle, you have to obviously refine all the position, orientation, everything like that. And it's defocused, it's Z position in the sample, and you have to know exactly where it 
you know, if you want high resolution, you have to take, pay attention to what defocus you're at because that changes the optics, that change, distorts the signal a bit and you have to correct for it. So you have to refine all that. That refines the map. Um, then the fitting is a separate step. You don't, the f you don't change the map according to the model. So you have the phases to begin with. So you don't want to bias it by saying, oh, I think this is the correct fit. You, you refine the map and then you just do the fitting after. It's two separate things. So that's different from crystallography. Um, okay, so the other thing, the final thing, I just wanted to bring it back to crystallography because this is a CCP4, um, that there's been this excitement about microelectron diffraction. So if you have tiny, tiny crystals, you can get electron diffraction. That seems to be a very good thing to do if you have like small molecules, because then you can solve them by direct methods. There isn't yet, at the moment, there is no phasing method for macromolecular 2D crystals, and they generally aren't. They don't make such good 2D crystals. So I think for macromolecules, I, I'm, I'm not convinced this is going to be that useful, but for small molecules, this does seem to be a, a you know, you do quite well with it. So I think that's, you know, crystallographers like that kind of thing. So, um, okay, so I think I'm pretty much finished. I hope there's going to be some questions. I wanted to just very briefly advertise that we we are actually setting up an online course in this at Birkbeck. This is like a, for students to sign up to, for people who want to know more about it. Um, Elena Orlova and I have been preparing this for some time. It's not ready yet, but it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, so I think I'll oops, just finish off with my silly picture. Hope there's some questions. <laughs> If there's time, is there time for questions? Yes, yes, okay. time for questions. Thanks for sticking with time. Okay, my microphone is on. So if you have a question, make sure that you wait for a microphone to reach you. Um, any questions? Oh, okay. I'll let you use mine. <laughs> it's a historical interest question, but uh, yeah. why did the, um, uh, why did the electronic, uh, what was it, what was the word receptors uh receptor plates oh, I mean, detectors yeah yeah why why did they get so much better well the main thing was that they became direct you could do direct electron detection so the there were several technical problems that had to be solved one is electron hardness so they the electrons are very damaging and so they would burn up the detector you couldn't just throw electrons on the detector directly until they worked out how to make things that were more resistant to the radiation. And the other was that, you know, it's a very small market compared to CCDs. You don't have electron detectors in all your phones, you know. So it took much, commercially, it was a slower thing. But also the amount of electronics to get all those fast readouts is, you know, it's, it's a very, there's a lot of technology that had to be, go into that to get the high speeds and the electron resistance and all that stuff. And then all the back thinning was another thing where the, the, the thinner, the thicker, the sample, the better the sensitivity, but then you get this scattering, electron hits and then it starts to scatter inside. So they, they had to back thin them to make, to, re to keep the high spatial resolution. So it's just, I think it was just a very big technical challenge. I mean, Richard Henderson is the one to really explain all that because he, he's been pushing that for a long time. Uh, a comment about the um, micro ED phasing. Mm -hmm. um, so, Facing methods shouldn't be an ultimate uh, limitation. We are working with uh, Jose Rodriguez and Amir on extending. Uh, I, sorry, I haven't. What would be a limitation? I didn't catch that. No, no. You were saying that uh, that phasing was currently a limitation. There isn't a my, there isn't a phasing there isn't a phasing method like heavy atom. Yeah, or, but yeah. Uh, you can overcome this uh, with uh, fragment uh, location and extension with the yes. amplification and. and We've been uh, working on this with uh, with Jose Rodriguez and Amir Gonen. But ultimately, the data, there's still a lot of improvement in the data themselves because maybe collecting them on the stage of the microscope rather than having more dedicated goniometer set up, it's not the best. So, so when the experiment uh, uh, of the micro ED collection improves, data should become much better, shouldn't they? I expect it can be improved. Yes, that's my personal prejudice that it's less. I mean, I, for me, I see the advantage of EM as having this, you know, things in solution that can take, adopt all the different conformations. So, you know, it's, if you're going to do crystallography, okay, that's one thing, but it's just a different, yeah, I've come from a different direction. But I, I think also it's just often, macromolecules often don't, in two, 2D crystals are often just not that high quality. You know, the, lattice, the, the order is not that perfect. 
So then you're better off doing single particles if you're going to have to, if you have disorder in the crystal. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Helen. I think uh, okay. we have to move on now. Uh, join me in thanking Helen.